Order 1082, and the motion adopted by the Committee on Monday, January 29th, 2024. The Committee will now resume its study of Canada's approach to Africa. I'd uh, now like to welcome our witnesses. Uh, we're very fortunate to have here with us um, three ambassadors. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Michael Callan, who is our ambassador uh, in Algeria. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ben-Marc uh, Diendre, the permanent observer uh, to the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, as well as Mr. Christopher Thornley, our High Commissioner uh, in the Republic of Kenya. I should add, uh, just for the benefit of the members, uh, that we would hoped, uh, we had hoped uh, that we could also uh, hear from uh, Ambassador Lorraine Anderson from Cameroon, uh, but unfortunately uh, she thought she had the right headphones, but then it subsequently came to light that they uh, were not appropriate, uh, so she will not be uh, joining us uh, today. Now, uh, for the ambassadors, I should say, um, I, I understand that Ambassador uh, Diandere uh, will be speaking on behalf of all three uh, ambassadors. But subsequent to that, uh, when there are uh, questions put to you by the members, uh, if you do look over, uh, if you are out of time, because there's only uh, five or six minutes per round of questions, if you see this uh, held up, that means you should be uh, tying it up uh, within 10 to 15 uh, seconds. So would be grateful if uh, every once in a while uh, you did look up at the camera. So all of that uh, having been uh, explained, uh, Ambassador Diandere, uh, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours and you have five minutes for your uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. President, Mesdames et Messieurs. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I am honored to appear before you today even though it's quite late here. It's now 11 p.m. from where I'm speaking, two hours less for Michael Cullen. But we're very happy to be here to speak with you, members of the committee. My name is Ben Mark Diandere, and I'm Canada's permanent observer to the African Union. I am the first full-time person in this role. I'm here today with my colleagues, as the chair just mentioned, Michael Callan, ambassador of Canada to Algeria, and Christopher Thornley, High Commissioner for Canada in the Republic of Kenya, and Permanent Representative to the United Nations Human Settlements Program and to the United Nations Environment Program. We are here two days after uh, Africa Day, and I'm very glad to be here. I'm sure that we are all in solid speak in solidarity with each other here. Meeting. My remark today will briefly outline the opportunity and challenges vis-à-vis -vis advancing a Canada engagement with Africa, countries, and institutions. My colleagues and I look forward to answering your question. On the opportunity, Africa is for, forecast to be the world's second fastest growing region in 2024 after Asia. It has one of the fastest growing middle classes, provided a source of dynamics and vast market potential. The, the wealth gap between remains deep, between, uh, remains deep with 60% of the world extreme poor living in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Le cas de développement reste profond dans ce pays. Dans this gap is huge in the continent. The continent's demographic youth bulge was 70% of sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 30 represents an opportunity. But the lack of adequate and market-relevant skills and employment opportunities is an impediment to their meaningful contribution to economic development. And peace and security challenges, ethnic vulnerability, particularly among women and youth, threatening the well-being of African youth, youth and young people. African countries and institutions are proactively exploring various op options to address their national, regional, and continental challenges. They seek mutually beneficial partnership that meet their needs and empower them to address their own challenges. They are diversifying and forging stronger relationships with global economic powers 
like China, India, and partners like Turkey and Gulf states. They are doing so bilaterally and through multilateral fora, such as BRICS and G20. Within the rapidly changing global environment and in response to calls by our African partners, Global Affairs Canada is redefining its engagement with this continent to better capitalize on mutual interest with African countries and institutions and support win-win partnership. My appointment as Canadian first dedicated partner observer, permanent observer to the African Union signals an intention to broaden and deepen Canadian engagement on the continent and our interests in enhancing partnership with African Union and its organs. As a prominent organization on the continent, our engagement with the African Union promotes our mutual interests in trade and investment, investment, democracy, human rights, and human development. Together, we're exploring new and better way of working, including with the private sector, to address development challenges and other continental priorities like peace and security. Mr. President. Mr. Chair, Canada's overall engagement with Africa is guided by the African Union's strategic vision for the continent as captured in Agenda 2063. This is a keystone of the future of our continent. We also have a flagship program, which will be the Continental Free Trade Zone. The most recent of these dialogues, or rather, we have an ongoing series of high-level dialogues with the African Union, which have proven to be a platform where our shared priorities can be discussed and common approaches established. The most recent of these dialogues took place in Addis Ababa earlier this month. Canada's Minister of International Development co-chaired with African Union Commission leadership discussions on how to evolve our international assistance to better respond to the needs and priorities identified by African countries and institutions. Canada welcome Adoye Bankole, the Commissioner on Political, Political Affairs, Peace and Security in Ottawa, where he met with Minister of Foreign Affairs, Melanie Jolie, and Global Affairs officials, as well as appearing before the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade. While our partnership with African Union is important for the reason I have described, we must always recognize that Africa is a vast continent made up of 54 and different countries with different economy, culture, and languages. African countries and institutions have been very clear about their interests and priority. At the continental level, the African Union Agenda 63 outlined a long-term vision focusing on sustainable and inclusive economic growth and good governance. At the national level, as my colleague can attest, national plans are in place in between these units of governance are the regional economic communities who, are, who have their own strategic planning. The government and the institutions d'Afrique ont été. African uh, governments and communities have been clear on their priorities. Country representative at the African Union and what our head of mission here through. If I could ask to wrap it up soon because uh, we're considerably over yes. the time limit. I get you, Mr. Chair is that African countries and institutions want more Canadian engagement, more investment, more dialogue, more partners, partnership based on mutual interests. Finally, we have been following the proceeding of the Senate House and after community studies. Your deliberations are very timely and noticed. We look forward for our outcome and working with you to advance Canadian interests, including mutual beneficial economics. Merci beaucoup. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Diandere. Uh, we start off with uh, MP Abel Taif. Uh, you have six minutes, sir. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the witness for appearing to today. Uh, Monsieur Diandere, you were appointed, uh, uh, or you took on your role in June 2023. Um, how do you describe the relationship between Canada and the African Union? Thank you. Thank you very much. My last 12 months have been dedicated to consolidated Canadian presence on both levels, African Union and the AUC. Our relations are very good with the, the, these two institutions right now. Um, I must say that... Yes, go ahead. 
I must say that uh, the relation, uh, as uh, there's there is room to be improved, but we are having a good uh, we are on a good track to do something very good with African Union right now. When you were appointed, you must have received a mandate. Uh, would you be able to yes. share that with the committee, please? The mandate was to strengthen the relationship with the African Union. Engage with the, the, all the organs in the AU, and part of the mandate will be to conduct the three dialogues we're working right now and make sure that we connect with the Agenda 26, 63 of uh, African Union and to mobilize also here in Canada, in Canada and uh, around the country, people around the, the strategic view of African development. Which areas, in your opinion, we need to be focusing on? Because Africa is a big uh, continent, 54 uh, countries, and, and it's very hard for us to be all over the place. Uh, so which areas we need to focus on uh, or which areas we need to improve um, our relationship there in order to be able uh, to be effective as we wish to be so? Thank you for the question. You know, the, the experience here is very different when you're sitting in Canada and you're watching what is happening in Africa. Right now, they have their agenda. Agenda 2063 is one of the flagship, uh, the strategic planning for the, for the continent. They got maybe plus thousand projects around agriculture, energy, uh, education, uh, I must add also the, the infrastructure project. So um, the focus for Canada has to be on uh, what we, the three dialogues we do, we're working on right now. Education is one of them. Agriculture will be for sure one of the, the, the subject we're following in these three dialogues. And uh, I will say the climate change is a, another focus, So, which means uh, we have to be uh, very aware of uh, all these green projects and uh, those projects who can leverage the, the women and youth on this continent. Do we have any leads of any of these projects that you can probably share with us? It's too early for me to, to share the uh, specific program because we, we're leaning right now on the, on the PANAF and development programs. Some of them are very uh, as are running since two or five years. Uh, I must say, on women's side, we have the project to to thanking the uh, the entrepreneurship for women, and we're doing with the Pan African countries, like uh, with three or four countries at the same time. We have project in uh, with uh, uh, in in the in the energy sector uh, also. Um, right now, I'm in uh, Nairobi because there is an annual meeting for um, uh, the African Development Bank, and 20, 10 to 20 plus Canadian enterprises are here on, in the sector of uh, energy and uh, also in the, the, the sector for agriculture. So um, I must say that uh, agriculture, education, and, uh, and still. And all these projects on the green economy are very important for us. And uh, some of our, our projects and partners here um, uh, are doing very well. So do we you, need to do you, more. Do you feel that we need to focus more, more our, uh, our attention on certain uh, countries? And uh, if that's uh, yes, uh, what countries do you think uh, we are the closest uh, with uh, at the moment since uh, your involvement? Uh, and your uh, experience in the region. Uh, I will ask my colleague to help me on this. But my first answer, uh, Mister, will uh, will be uh, it's too early in the multilateral environment to choose one of two countries. But we still uh, we we can sense some countries. Uh, are doing very well right now, and they can be a pilot for us. But I I'll, let I'll uh, go to Mr. Thorne. Colleague... I think we, I met with him in 2018 in Nigeria. If he can weigh on this question, please. Thank you very much, MP. Uh, am I, can you hear me okay? 
Um, and I remember our meeting very seconds, well. Seconds, please. Appreciate. 30 seconds, Good to please. see you again. Yep. Um, I think in terms of uh, focusing on countries, uh, we know the ones that are doing well. Uh, I live in one of them here in Kenya right now. I could name a couple of other ones. Uh, but there are models where the uh, economy is more advanced, and I think that's where we can um, establish a, a foothold. Thank you. Uh, before we go to uh, the next member, um, Madam McPherson, do you have your hand up? Is that a point of order? I, I do. It's a point of information, actually. Are we? Are we only? Are we not hearing from the other two witnesses? I, I perhaps missed that, but I, I'm wondering if we. If is there only one? Um, speech. As I noted uh, at the outset, um, our ambassador to uh, Cameroon was unable to join us uh, because uh, she thought she had the right uh, headset, but it subsequently came to light that it uh, does not meet the specifications. Uh, so Mr. Thornley and Mr. Callan will not be providing comments? No, they, they will, but um, but the opening remarks uh, alone were for Mr. Dierdere, uh but okay. uh, we can uh, pose questions to all three of the ambassadors. Thank you. So uh, we next go to MP Oliphant. You have six minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Ambassadors, High Commissioners, for uh, joining us today. I don't know where I'm looking uh, because you're on the screen. <laughs> Um, it is uh, really uh, great to be with you today and to thank you for your work representing Canada. Uh, I start with our um, permanent observer to the African Union, Monsieur uh, Diendare. Um, what was your biggest surprise? I'm going off script here. Uh, what was your biggest surprise uh, uh, in, in assuming your position at, in Addis Ababa? One of my thank you, Mr. Alphant, and thank you, PSA, for and thank you for your last visit to us. That uh, that was uh, very helpful to to engage with African Union. My one of my big surprise was uh, is still the the bias people on the African Union as with Africa uh, with Canada. They still love us. They need us. They really enjoying our presence. They. The brain is still there. We have got a couple of things to do, but the brand of Canada is still up there. And they seeing us as a um, enabler. They seeing us as a, a power who can be something very interesting for them. And uh, I must say, yes, uh, the bias, the, the, all my interlocutors are for, are for Canada, a positive one. Still. Uh, uh, Hi, Commissioner Thornley. Uh, uh, good to see you here again, too. Um, not the biggest surprise. You are uh, really a, a one of our specialist um, uh, representatives in uh, on the continent. Uh, Ghana, Togo, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, now uh, Kenya. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, to deepen our relationship, uh, Canada, with uh, individual countries, not the AU as, a, as a, uh, such, but with individual bilateral relations? What's our maybe our biggest opportunity and our biggest challenge? Uh, thank you, P.S. Um, I think probably our biggest challenge is developing more interest and engagement uh, from, Can from Canada, whether it be from companies, uh, civil society, um, government to government relations. Uh, there are many distractions in the world right now, many challenges. Um, and I think it's very important not to lose sight that Africa is such a growing uh, continent uh, with many countries with tremendous potential um, and others that have serious need. I also cover Somalia and that uh, truly is a country uh, in desperate need of continued humanitarian and development assistance. Um, so we need what, uh, whatever can be done to increase engagement. Um, I have a background in trade development as well and I was very pleased to see in the last fall economic statement uh, and I believe in the budget um, uh, measures to increase risk appetite, for example, from crown corporations such as EDC and CCC, which will uh, help de-risk uh, some commercial activities, which then, of course, increase people to people and uh, all kinds of other engagement uh, that is so required to develop our relationships with African countries. You, you used my magic word, which I use a lot about de-risking, and I want to turn to uh, Ambassador Callan. Uh, you uh, in Algeria have uh, are living in a difficult neighborhood, 
a relatively calm uh, country, uh, but surrounded by Mali, Niger, uh, Libya, not far from Chad, Burkina Faso. Um, tell me a little bit about the security situation, both in southern Algeria, but also in your neighborhood, and whether you are seeing um, any changes for the good or for the, or for the worse. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Parliamentary Secretary. Yeah, it, uh, it's true, and it's, it's an important observation that the security situation in the neighborhood uh, is deteriorating, and I, I think that's a, an important, just objective observation that the that the uh, trends are, uh, are are negative uh, across the across the Sahel. They're uh, they're alarming for us. They're alarming for our our Algerian partners with the extent of the border uh, that they uh, that they maintain with Mali and Niger. You know, they're seeing the direct uh, the direct effect of that insecurity through increased flows of uh, irregular migration um, and so and that's a that's a concern for uh, for a number of reasons uh, from the for the immediate uh, uh, potential to destabilize uh, um, the uh, political equilibrium in uh, in Algeria as well as some of our other North African countries um, but also I th I'd suggest uh, in that in, in those insecure contexts, uh, it creates uh, it creates new openings uh, for uh, other actors to uh, to try and pronounce themselves, and, and they have, and that, that's been a concern uh, that both uh, uh, Algeria, for example, and uh, and we share very dearly. Um, I have one minute. Uh, just on the re the regional economic communities, um, uh, particularly uh, um, High Commissioner. Um, Thornley and, and Ambassador uh, Callan, any comments on how Canada should relate to ECOWAS, EGAD, and the other uh, economic communities? Uh, maybe I could jump in. Um, I think with the regional economic communities, we have to recognize that uh, they have some strengths and many weaknesses. Uh, the parts are bigger than the whole. Um, but there are opportunities to work with them. For example, uh, when Madame Jolie was here, um, she engaged with EGAD um, on Sudan. There's still opportunities where we may be able to carve out a role for EGAD to play a little bit of leadership in that area. Same with the East African community um, on uh, issues around uh, the Eastern DRC. Um, there are areas where we can work with them and perhaps guide them to pinpointing to find uh, positive solutions. But we also have to be realistic that they are generally not terribly strong organizations. When I was in Nigeria, I dealt with ECOWAS. I could see them, for example, be quite successful in the Gambia uh, when there was instability there because they made a concerted decision to move forward on it. But in other times, they um, can be uh, underwhelming in their responses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Callan, if I could ask you to respond to that question in subsequent rounds, uh, because we are out of time uh, for this round. Uh, we next go to uh, Mr. Bergeron. You have six minutes. Merci, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. And first, I'd like to thank all our witnesses for coming today, and thank you for having made yourselves available at uh, such a late hour in the day. Thank you for all your observations, Mr. Diendere. I believe, and gave us a good picture of the importance and the opportunities that Africa presents for Canada. Now, Canada has to be able to put into effect its own ideas and maybe even clarify those ideas following the publication of the Indo-Pacific strategy. So that was a framework in itself. This could serve as a framework. And we weren't too sure, though, what the government was planning on doing. And we don't know what it's planning on doing in terms of Africa. There was a consultation, apparently, by the public servants of GAC to learn more about engagement possibilities on the African continent. And that consultation ended on the 30th of July last. So my question is simple. On the continent, was the Canadian Diplomatic Corps asked to uh, participate in those consultations? Thank you, Mr. Bergeron, for the question. Yes, 
We did participate in those consultations. Uh, for my part, I had only just begun, so I was consulted on what I knew. But I know efforts have been made to wrap up this study or consultations. And the question, the important question now is, are we following Africa's rate and rhythm? And I would say that, you know, there is what's happening in the African Union. And leadership is changing. And I know that the decision may come back on the table. But my observations on the ground show me that uh, we have to decide how we're going to engage on the ground. I've had high-level conversations with diplomats, and they are also talking about how they're going to position themselves and what, how they are going to be involved with the continent. It's nothing new for us, and it's not the last time we'll be doing this, but I'm very pleased that this is happening because it can either lead to great disappointment or it can lead to further reflection on where we're headed and what our relationship is now with the continent. Thank you very much for that. Several witnesses who came before us told us that there are big expectations on the continent and they don't seem to be as interested anymore with the former uh, countries involved, like France, for example. So there seem to be... Bergeron, but there is no translation. Sorry to interrupt. Interpretation, English interpretation. Can you hear the English interpretation? Excellent. Um, so, as I was saying, there seems to be more and more resistance on the continent with respect to those countries that did, uh, uh, that are occupying the space left by colonial powers, for example, China and Russia. And so there are high expectations with respect to Canada. Do you feel that to date, Canada has been able to meet those expectations in Africa? Merci, Monsieur le député. Thank you. I can't necessarily answer for Africans, but what I can tell you is this. They have been very receptive to the decision to have a permanent observer. And so that you or know, so that you know there are only five countries to have two representatives here. One for a bilateral work and the other with respect to multilateral relations with the continent, the United States, Italy. Switzerland, Japan are the others. So there aren't many of us who have sent these individuals. So we're a very small group here observing and who want to engage. I continue to think that Canada is still very favorably looked at here. There are high expectations. And given our experience in areas such as ed education, agriculture, and energy, uh, that kind of expertise could, be, could benefit Africa. So I feel that that relationship should be developed with African Union. For those who are resisting relationships with other countries, we... It, Oh, I would say the only thing we can do is learn and not repeat the same mistakes when we're dealing with the African Union. Excellent. Seconds remaining, Mr. Bergeron. Oui, mais Monsieur le Président, je vous... Chair, I'd just like to point out that I did lose a few seconds with the uh, interpretation, so if you'd just allow me a few more seconds. Seconds. Merci. Alors, je vais tout de suite camper uh, le sujet. Pour... Thank you. I'll just set the stage for uh, the next round. One thing that does show us that Africa is a country of opportunities and is very promising is the whole area of la francophonie. Thanks to Africa, French 
could be a language that no, will be growing the fastest over the next several decades. Mr. Jean-Louis Roy told us, however, that in order for that to happen, schools need to be built in order to be able to reflect the demographic growth happening in Africa. And without French schools, of course, Arabic will be learned, Wolof will be learned, Swahili will be learned, but French will not be learned. So I'll come back to that on, in the second round. So get ready, because that's the question I'm going to ask you about. Uh, we next go to uh, MP McPherson. Uh, you have six minutes. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to, to thank all of the witnesses for being here today and sharing your expertise with us and, and, and your, your, your service, certainly. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start, I think, with you, Mr. Yandre, if I could. You, you spoke about the, the power of the, a, of the African Union, and, and we know now that the African Union has, has increasingly recognized that when they vote together, when they, when they work together multilateral, uh, in multilateral flora, that there is um, better opportunity, I guess. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, if Canada has recognized that sufficiently, um, it, you know, because we've seen, for example, the Security Council seat where, where we where were not successful because, um, in part, because countries within Sub-Saharan and, and within the continent of Africa did not support our bid. Um, and I'm wondering if, if our approach is somewhat dated in terms of how we inter interact with the African Union. I know this is a difficult question for you to, to answer, but it's certainly one I wanted to ask. Thank, thank you for the question. Um, I'll try to answer this in French, just to make sure. Please my, do. Yeah, please yeah, do. Let, let me do it. To notice that right now in and on the continent, it's not just about the influence. It's about who can bring something different on the table. Mm -hmm. Yes, the things are changing. Les choses changent rapidement. Uh, francophonie. And the Francophonie, the Commonwealth. Big groups are, are playing on the continent. And you can add of this the Gulf states, India, China, and Russia. So that's what's happening on the continent now. I don't judge Canada. I've never been judged because things change very, very quickly and are changing very quickly. So between when I arrived and now, the African Union uh, entered the G20, Ethiopia and a few other countries entered BRICS. So things are changing so quickly that even the dynamic on in the continent requires constant monitoring, constant, constant monitoring. Now, does Canada realize this? I think so. All our actions to date uh, that are focused on, for example, the linguistic accent, the language aspect, uh, we've had discussions about strengthening multilateralism and the rule of law. These are all ways in which we can remain relevant. And yes, Africa's influence will be strong. More than half of but I'm just going to give you a little bit of an example of, of perhaps something that, that I could get some information on. Um, you know, what we're seeing across, uh, across many countries is increasing conflict. Obviously, Sudan is something that everyone is, is quite worried about, the conflict that we're seeing escalating in Sudan and the impact on, on civilians. How, in, in, in terms of supporting the African Union, how is Canada supporting the African Union in building peace in Sudan, for example? You know, we, we know that Canada, in terms of peacekeepers, is not really present on the continent at all anymore. Um, how are we providing some of those services to the AU? How are we supporting that peace building initiative? Madame la députée, merci pour votre question. Thank you for the question. We are at all discussion tables, whether it be within the IGAD which is the uh, regional authority. And we're also speaking with our partners, with the United States, Great Britain. And we are all strengthening this message of peace. We also consult with experts on the Sudan who are following what's happening and that support the African Union. Even the African Union has had trouble getting organized with respect to the Sudan. But they are trying 
and they've come back to the table where they're looking for a solution with Sudan. So only if, obviously, the, uh, there's agreement to stop the hostilities. But we are speaking with these countries. We have a very good ally in Canada. Our officials meet and have met when they come here to reinforce Canada's uh, position in terms of finding a solution for Sudan. So our country still has a significant amount of credibility at these discussion tables and when they happen. So it's good. On the, f yes. on the ground. And maybe, maybe I'll just pass it on. I, I, I'm sorry I've been monopolizing your time, but Mr. Kalan, perhaps you'd like to offer something as well, considering the region that you're that you're in, just in terms of how Canada can support peace negotiations, can support peace building and peacekeeping within the region. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question. And there's a, there's a whole wide range of ways we uh, we can and do uh, um, through. Uh, there's all kinds of peace building uh, support that's uh, that's funded directly from uh, from Ottawa that supports grassroots organizations that are working to bring communities together uh, to to address the real um, divides at the grassroots level. Um, so even offering uh, mediation support, even if it's not frontline mediation, uh, there's track two, track three, more subtle, uh, less uh, less overt efforts uh, that, that often can be instrumental in, uh, in bringing people together and just enabling conversations that, that perhaps some of the, you know, the, the, the frontier, tier one uh, uh, mediation efforts uh, 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 would, uh, would would not bring as much uh, attention to, because um, you know, relating back to a point that was made earlier, our brand is still very strong, uh, and so the avenue for Canada to to play that role in bringing parties together uh, is unique and it's special, uh, and uh, I, I, and uh, because of that uh, uniqueness uh, that not many countries uh, uh, can bring to the table, um, it's it's an area that we've uh, we've doubled down on. Thank you very much. I believe that's my time. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, we now go to Mr. Chong. Mr. Chong, you have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my questions are for Ambassador Callan and High Commissioner Thornley. Uh, you know, as you know, this committee is studying Canada's, the government of Canada's approach to Africa. And so my question is simple. What advice uh, do you, what key advice, what key two or three recommendations do you have for this committee? I think we're not sure who goes first. Go ahead, go ahead Michael. Yeah, sure. Um, one thing to take note that uh, 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 surprised me, but uh, but it's become part of my daily reality, is just how competitive the space is uh, right now. It's competitive in commercial terms. Uh, it's competitive in diplomatic terms. Uh, um, it's competitive uh, between uh, uh, you know with some of our adverse adversaries uh, adversaries, and it's uh, competitive with some of our like-minded as well on the commercial side. Um, and you know, so that's and that's not to to, uh, uh, to speak negatively of that sense of competition, uh, but it's serious business. And as uh, geopolitical uh, uh, shifts uh, continue on, um, uh, we just uh, need, need to be serious in in how we're bringing all of our tools to the table in order to advance our the interests and values that we we all care so deeply about. And, and in large measure, we're we're doing this uh, in many ways. Um, but uh, but I think you know the North African context sometimes uh, can be can be helpful because there's it's it's a very uh, um, distinct presence of a of a non-aligned position and uh, nobody wants to be in one camp or the other. Um, but I do see some of our competitors uh, really uh, re really bringing everything they they can to the table. Um, and I know that, uh, that that we're doing everything we can with our tools as well. And so I just encourage the committee to, to um, approach some of these questions in that spirit of, uh, of really being serious of, of, what, uh, of what's at stake at the moment. Uh, thank you. I, I, could, I could follow on if, uh, if that's all right. Um, I would agree it's a highly competitive environment. Uh, Kenya is a more advanced country. Um, we see very active involvement, for example, from a country like Turkey or from the Gulf states. Um, and they're very present and their presence is known. Uh, Turkey has been opening embassies in almost every country uh, on the continent. 
Uh, I'm not saying that we should uh, open a lot of new embassies or representation, but what I am saying is we have to be aware of our competition uh, and be willing to act and also be willing to work with them uh, where it might be possible. Um, I think we need to be thinking very um, carefully about people-to-people uh, -people linkages, about our diaspora, diasporas, uh, if that's a plural. Uh, there are many in Africa. They're a great asset for us. Um, and to be thinking about uh, how we conduct uh, immigration. We've been wor working very closely with uh, Kenya, for example, on uh, orderly um, and uh, let's call it demand-driven immigration. Uh, where they will be working more closely with provinces and uh, industry associations uh, to identify gaps, provide training, um, and have people go to Canada who are set up to succeed. It's a bit of a win-win situation. Uh, and finally, I think just to be agile. Um, we were asked, for example, um, to play a role with Kenya, um, and we asked Kenya to step up on Haiti. So uh, there are those... Uh, third country uh, opportunities to work with Africa. We shouldn't always view Africa as an aid recipient, but also as a partner that can help us, including in our own neighborhood in that example. And I think uh, I'll finish on this. Uh, in the United States uh, designation of Kenya, I'm just talking on my own neighborhood as a non-NATO ally uh, during President Ruto's visit, uh, the only one in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, speaks to the potential for developing very strong relationships. Thank you. Uh, we next go to uh, MP Chatel. You have four minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair, and welcome to all our witnesses. So we're very pleased to have you here, especially given this late hour, because it's a very important study for us, and I hope for you as well. I'd like to begin with Mr. Djendere. We heard many witnesses refer to Agenda 63 before this committee. There's the strategic plan. We also heard witnesses underscore the importance of what Canada can contribute. Now, you mentioned the four sectors that are very important, agriculture, education, infrastructure, and energy. You also mentioned resilience and climate change and the knowledge that Canada could contribute. You didn't have time to wrap up on uh, the important projects that you started talking about projects that are being led by Canadian companies. Could you give us some concrete examples of the kind of knowledge and the economic development that Canada could bring to Africa? Thank you very much for the question. Well, I've uh, seen Canadian companies propose, for example, manufacturing to manufacturing solar panels, for example, rechargeable panels, uh, looking for s agricultural solutions, for example, with respect to fertilizers, etc. And Canadian companies have also come with uh, nutritional products for children. So there, is, there are things happening. There is action. You know, I could speak to you outside of this and I could give you a long list of Canadian companies that are involved, but there is some very good work that is happening and there are good leaders here on the continent. You know, there is work uh, in the mining sector as well, but there are so many other businesses and there are small and medium-sized businesses, some that are extremely active on the ground. What's interesting about this approach is that we use a development uh, a lens when it comes to Canadian companies. And these companies come with expertise and they have very clear intentions. Sometimes it has to do with uh, gender, with children. There are female-led companies as well. So, so these businesses are very appreciated. And there are also other kinds of local investment that happens from, for, ex for example, with NGOs. So there are some good things happening in terms of development along with Canadians. Now, to come back to the previous question, 
One, uh, one important asset would be to look at very specific areas. And Agenda 63 is a, a very interesting document. It's well worth becoming familiar with because it has to do with the kind of Africa we want to build. build. Uh, there are all kinds of, uh, that, for example, we have a huge free trade zone, one of the biggest on the planet. So there is so much that Canada can contribute to and so many contributions that Canada can make. Thank you very much. That's all very interesting. I think I'm going to follow up now with Mr. Callan and Mr. Thornley. If ever you can give us examples in your areas or in your re I'm afraid yeah. it's over four minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we will now go to uh, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Bergeron, you have two minutes. Mon Dieu. Two. Well, that's a lot. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to come back to my preamble. There are countries uh, that have kicked out France. We know that Canada has worked very hard to get Algeria to join the International Francophonie Organization. So my first question would be this. Mr. Sada went on behalf of Canada at the time, and he attempted to convince Algeria to join the organization. We know that Algeria, like many other uh, ex-colonies, for example, Rwanda, have been trying to increase the presence of English in their countries. Is Canada still trying to get Algeria to join the organization? And what are the relation? What is the relationship like between Canada and Algeria? Does it happen in French or in English? Um, good question. Thank you. Thank you for it. And uh, take the irony of me responding in English if you could view the the late hour. Um, uh, we we engage exclusively in in, uh, in French, uh, in, entirely with uh, with the Algerian government. And, and you're right. You, you've touched on a very sensitive point for the Algerians. Uh, you know, they have a with, with their with their fraught history with uh, the French presence. It's part of their culture. It's part of their identity. Um, but it's one that they are deliberately uh, making a move away from uh, by. Uh, uh, just just recently, they uh, they switched. So the second official language being taught in schools is now uh, is now English, um, and so there's a deliberate move away. We do try uh, and uh, and encourage closer links with the Francophonie for for all the good reasons that uh, you know well and, and mentioned some of them. Um, we do so more from from an operational uh, vantage point that it it just presents another network of, uh, of um, and another community for them uh, to have influence uh, at and to uh, and, and to benefit from. Um, and so there's you know there's a little bit of uh, polite reception for that, but. You can't uh, you can't stress enough um, you know, the trauma uh, within the culture that that remains, um, and and how uh, how much of a uh, you know a hot button issue it is uh, to suggest that they uh, ought to retain a part of the culture which many parts uh, of uh, uh, many Algerian authorities um, are, are doing what they can to uh, to push away from. We will now go to uh, Madam McPherson. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Callahan, Mr. DeAndre, you both spoke about how Canada's brand is strong. And I, I, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. I, I don't want to put you in a, in a bad situation, but, you know, in the Senate study, there was there was witnesses that said that Canada is becoming increasingly irrelevant in Africa. Um, I was actually on the parliamentary group that was just in Tanzania, and and they asked, "Where is Canada?" The Parliament of of Tanzania asked where we were if we were we were missing from their perspective. Um, you know, we know that there has been a lot of 
uh, support for multilateral development in sub-Saharan Africa and, and less support for Canadian organizations. So I'm going to put it to all three of you. What could Canada do uh, to make itself more relevant on, on, uh, on the, in the African continent? Um, you know, I, I understand that you said that it is very relevant, but I, or the brand is strong, but, I, but we, have, we have heard as well that it is, it is yeah. that's questionable. And I'm wondering if there are things that we could do to strengthen that brand. Mm -hmm. Mr. Okay. Mr. Thornley, I haven't asked you a question yet. Why don't I start with you and then I'll go to Mr. Callan. Thank you, MP. I, I think uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick because I know time is short, but um, one always has to work on a brand um, and you can't, uh, you know, take it for granted. I think in order to strengthen our brand, we have to find uh, constant ways to engage and be listening, which I believe we are, uh, in terms of what uh, our African partners are looking for. A big part of that, and I'll go back to what I spoke about earlier, I think is um, engagement uh, at a commercial level. They are looking for investment. I'm very pleased with the work, for example, that FinDev uh, is doing here in Kenya. Their biggest and first investment is in Kenya with an organization called MCOPA, which provides um, very innovative microfinance uh, starting in the solar sector and now in transportation. So as a result of that investment, um, drivers of motorcycles who provide transportation are driving electric bikes and able to invest, uh, finance them on a daily basis. That kind of engagement uh, ups our brand uh, incredibly, and um, there's always more that we could be doing in those kinds of areas in a creative way. Thank you. Yeah. And just, just building off of that, then um, I think you're also very right uh, that the, the brand is, briefly, is still present and, and still strong. Um, sometimes we hear that uh, that uh, African partners uh, need Canada. I'm not sure that's any longer the case. Many do want Canada, but there's other options now. Um, and so we can be a preferred partner because of the, the quality of our products, uh, the, uh, the you know often uh, you know the caricature of us being uh, uh, a moral value based player. You know that that does count. It still does count. Um, but um, but they don't need us any uh, uh, if if they ever did. Um, I think if there's one thing that we could do, and it sounds a little bit cliche, but it just matters, and we can't get thank you from it. Is just the value of investing in relationships with uh, with high level authorities. Relationships are, matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we go to uh, Mr. App. You have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the testimony thus far. I'm going to continue along the same vein that uh, Ms. McPherson was on. Last week, a number of us attended the Global Cooperation Caucus. Stanley Ochanu, the Nigerian director for one, actually stated that Canada has been breadcombing, breadcrumbing, sorry, African countries, offering just enough for a connection, but really avoiding the true commitment. And so, I, you know, there's, we've all heard the calls from NGOs, from diaspora communities, from all of us around this table and other groups that we want a clear approach, strategy, call it what you want. So I'll start with you, Monsieur Delende, today. Do we not need a specific? Uh, we, we've heard much general testimony, and over the last half hour I've gotten into more specifics. But to get to something that actually has a deliverable component to it on a strategy, do we as Canada not need to focus and make some hard decisions on priorities? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And I agree with you. Yes, we need to focus a little bit, but we, we, we're having two dialogues. The last one we did in just one month have a true component for focusing on, on, on stuff that's very great for Canada and Africa. Um, the development dialogue we, we, we just launched as a component on TVET, which is a vocational education. Uh, there are component on agriculture, the component on women entrepreneurship and even research and development on, on, on it. With, with the, the way we're doing the, the, the new strategy and en amont ce que nous on train de faire avec les trois. And upstream, I think that the three policies that we have are giving us opportunities, that is to say, they'll lead to very focused projects. And brands are brands. We have a strong brand because we know people want to deal with Canada. I've never been in I've never been in one meeting where I didn't meet someone who knew someone in Canada, a member of their family, or someone had visited, and that's also very important because that also contributes to how we're seen. 
um, various theme, but uh, I think we're getting there with the the, the relation we're building with African Union, the Commission of Af- African Union. Thank, thank you. Let me let me test out some specifics. Um, in our trade relationships, the uh, we now have yourself as the permanent observer at the, at the AU. Should Canada pursue a free trade agreement with the free trade bloc through the AU, or should Canada pursue specific free trade agreements? You know, with countries where there's there's a, a, a fit, a synergy, uh, and then within some sort of a focused strategy, let's put some deliberals, 10 countries, if we choose a second route. What would be your comment with that? Uh, I will start and I leave the, the floor to, 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 to Chris on this. But you know what? I'm coming from private sector. My last... <laughs> job was in the private sector. I know the, the, the importance of trade, the importance of having a, a pilot and, and the strategic planning on everything. So, je comprends très, très bien l'idée qu'on peut... Am- so, I understand very well the idea that you can have this free trade relationship with Africa, but Africa is 54 countries. And it's very... There are very volatile places. So, we have to make sure that it's going to work. We could be focusing on some pilot countries, for example, or, or for example, or strengthening our relationship with others, for example, Kenya, and even Algeria, when it comes to wheat and grains, for example. And there are other countries that would be good to deal with in terms of mining. Free trade with Africa is one of the the, 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 the the way to do it. But my sense right now is to be more cautious because everything is, is volatile on, on, on the continent and we need to keep our energy on the, the right place for the benefit of the uh, some countries and, and, and Canada. So I know my time is up, Mr. Chair, but I would love to hear from Mr. Thornley on that. If and I'll, I'll just put that out there. Um. Mr. Thornley, did you want to provide a 20-second uh, response? Sure. I think uh, I would agree you have to focus. Uh, there are countries where we can achieve a success and a, a platform, and there's building blocks uh, for trade. We have to start with things like foreign investment protection agreements, double taxation agreements, um, and then work towards free trade agreements and also look at tools that are another step towards a free trade agreement like the uh, U.S. model of a uh, trade and investment framework agreement, which is really just uh, the stage below a full FDA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if we could now go to uh, MP Al Gabra, you have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses uh, for joining us today. Uh, perhaps I'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, DeAndre. Uh, my question to you is if you were to assess or evaluate the, expert, the Africa expertise within GAC, uh, what's your evaluation of the expertise within GAC? Oh, thank you. The, 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 this is one of my favorite topics. Coming from private sector, coming from outside, I have the privilege to see the expertise inside now. Uh, if I had been told six months ago that I'd be able to find that expertise, well, expertise? Oh. We need to be organized. I don't necessarily like to talk about the things that I don't know about, but... People on the uh, Global Affair Canada uh, during my nine months there is, uh, is so valuable. But as the transformation we're doing right now at uh, Global Affair Canada, we're going to be more focused on, on things. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. So uh, I guess I'm trying to read between the line. Uh, uh, you're saying there's um, adequate or um, or proper expertise, or do we need to strengthen? What, what we're looking for as a committee is issue recommendations to government. And uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is given the evolving uh, dynamics in Africa, given the changing world, uh, do we have enough um, expertise uh, or do we need to um, in- increase our focus or enhance our skills that exist within GAC? And also, I'm curious about the footprint in Africa. Yeah. There are always a place... Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Yeah, there are always a place for improvement. But right now, if we need experts in finance, we have it. 
If we need experts in invest, investment, we have them. If we need experts in agriculture, we also have them. In development, humanitarian, we got all these expertise, they have been built around the time. I mean, ça fait longtemps qu'on travaille euh, que le ministère... So the department has been working on these things for a long time. Yes, things change. Expertise on this. There is an EI right now, l'intelligence artificielle, which is starting to be something very important in Africa. In this Great. continent, people are leapfrogging, and uh, we need to cope with all these things. And I guess... Um, we need improvement on some places, but I'm adamant on this. We have the expertise, we need to reorganize, and we're doing that with the transformation of the, the department. So, Chris, uh, you want to take a chose, but I think. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Thornley, I think you're the one who mentioned the engaging the diaspora. Uh, that's um, um, almost always been an issue trying to figure out how to op operationalize that. How do we uh, systemically uh, benefit from the knowledge and the skills and the expertise that Canadians of certain backgrounds have to help Canada further strengthen and advance its interest in a certain region. Do you have any advice or recommendation? How do we ensure that we benefit from uh, the expertise that Canadians who are from uh, African origin uh, to f f enhance or advance our relationship with Africa? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, MP, and um, you understand this very well, even from a personal level. It's very important uh, to work with individuals, identify individuals, probably in every large Canadian corporation. Um, I was talking to somebody who happened to be from Kenya, who's quite senior in one of our big banks, for example. Uh, you can identify some of those individuals and they can identify others. So there's no magic solution. Uh, we do have... Um, organizations such as the Canadian Chamber of Business, which has a lot of members of the diaspora who have stepped forward uh, because they want to promote uh, better and stronger relations uh, between Canada and African countries um, in universities. Um, so I think we're reaching a critical mass uh, where, honestly, it's not too hard to find really solid people, and it's a matter of working with them. Um, I'm quite proud of a, a good program we have, and I believe the name's changed, and I apologize, I don't have it that we were developing in the Trade Commissioner Service uh, to have mentors um, for uh, experienced business people, both in Canada and abroad, to help smaller companies get into markets. And I think uh, that kind of work to developing those mentoring relationships, because let's face it, uh, Africa has tremendous potential, but is a, a more difficult market than some others. Uh, so we need to provide pathways for people uh, where we can make it as easier uh, as easy for them as possible. Hmm. Thank you all. We now go to uh, Mr. Hoback. Mr. Hoback, you have four minutes. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Wendy. So first question, uh, historically we've had lots of students come in, and in from Africa that are educated in Canada. How is that helping or hurting in regards to uh, moving forward and seeing people doing business back and forth between Canada and Africa with these students when they go home? Sure. May, may, I, may I take that one? Yeah, sure. Just uh, because I, I think there's a, a link that can, make, that can be made with the previous question as well, um, and it's, it's less on the diaspora per se, but it's with uh, with, with Africans who have Canadian experience. And um, in terms of you know what more can be done, uh, I think there's probably some room to, to, to help organize uh, in terms of uh, alumni groups. Uh, I, I know uh, uh, my, my colleagues will uh, will know many well placed. People within their the governments that they uh, that they uh, uh, that they're accredited to uh, that have a number of Canadian graduates uh, well placed in their in their governments. I, I'm not sure we always do uh, everything we we can to uh, to organize them and to to cultivate and maintain those okay. uh, those Canadian connections and Canadian experiences. And uh, I think there's there could be some interesting work to, to be done there. Okay. There's, so there's, so you'd you know. say generally it's been positive then. So when we see restrictions in the number of students that are allowed to come into Canada now, how is that going to impact us in the future? It's a good question. Uh, uh, it's not uh, difficult to, to predict exactly how we'll, we'll, we'll 
uh, pan out. Um, and I know one thing, it's not uh, necessarily the, 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 the volume uh, of exchanges, um, but there's a quality dimension there. And I think if we, we work with, uh, with those that do get the chance to, to study um, in earnestly, you know, there's still a lot that, we can, uh, that can be done okay. uh, to capitalize on those, those, uh, so we'll, those exchanges. So we'll make the best of it is what you're basically saying then. I guess the other question I have is, where is there opportunities for Canadians uh, to work with other countries in some of these countries instead of trying to do this all by ourselves? Is there opportunity there where we could actually... Instead of trying to take on a project by ourselves, actually work with maybe uh, maybe France, the UK, other countries that would actually enhance the project to make it more successful uh, in those types of partnerships. Have we had any experience doing that? Yeah, I'd say that that's probably more often the norm uh, is that we do uh, do work hand in glove with uh, like-minded partners, uh, multilateral organizations that have their own expert expertise uh, in house and their own networks as well. Uh, so more more often than not, uh, we're collectively working and pooling resources and pooling knowledge uh, to, to maxim maximize the impact of, uh, of of every dollar we we invest. So then, there, so when it comes to the business side of, of things, I know the. Uh, Europe has been very aggressively investing in throughout Africa. Uh, we've seen Russia investing half, half, through security, being very involved in the region. Uh, wouldn't we be better working with our European allies to look at where we can fulfill what's being left out from them, considering that they're so far ahead of us compared to where we're at today? Well, um, I I'd say yes, I'd agree, I'd agree with you. I think there's, uh, in terms of uh, focusing on areas of uh, where we can have the greatest impact, and I know that's, uh, you know, focus is a word that's come up a number of times, and I believe strongly in it, uh, in concentrating on our comparative advantage. And, and Canada has many of them, and, uh, which, which, uh, which opens a lot of doors for us. Uh, we, don't, we need not, we need not uh, uh, compete with uh, our European uh, partners head-to-head, uh, um, but there's a, there's 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 often room, and uh, you know we've talked on some of, we've mentioned some of the sectors, whether it's agriculture, uh, agriculture education, ICT, uh, mining, certainly. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off because uh, I don't have much time. Yeah, uh, sure. Please like go in ahead. The, right now, we've seen we've got an Asia Pacific plan. Like there's a plan laid out, mm -hmm. it's written out, it's documented, it's published. Do you see something like that forthcoming with Africa? Do you see us actually putting together a document such as, as that to actually have a game plan so that everybody knows what the goals are, everybody understands what our objectives would be? Uh, is that something that's in the works at this point in time? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Ben Mark, do you want to take that just on the, on the, uh, the approach We're to Africa more generally? Already? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I must say yes, and um, I'm confident that we, we're going to have something very comprehensive for Africa. And uh, I don't want to mirror the, the our engagement or whatever we're doing with Egypt uh, with the Indo-Pacific, parce que c'est deux régions totalement différentes. Because these are two completely different areas, and the realities are completely different. However, so it may not be the same document, but it could be quite comprehensive because we're looking at getting those ideas and a strategy that will be long-lasting. Over a minute over time, Mr. Hoback. Mr. Hoback, we're over a minute over time. Thank you. So uh, we will now go to Mr. Zubrary. You have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I want to thank the witnesses for being here, especially at this late hour that many of you um, have right now. Um, I'd like to start, start with Ambassador uh, Dendary. Um, just to know about the priorities that Canada has with respect to African Union's uh, Agenda 2063, what, what priorities um, do we have and can you elaborate on them? Uh, and what does Canada have to offer? Thank you, thank you, Mr. MP. Uh, we have right now uh, two dialogue, one on trade and the second one will be, is the development one. Uh, we can provide you with the, the content of this, these two dialogues we, we have with the African Union. The two dialogues are very in line with the Agenda 2063 objectives. And we're trying right now to focus at, uh, um, uh, to make the Sassure Kone, the, 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 the the, the peace clear. To make sure that we have good pathways that are very clear. After nine months, um, 
that's my my time here. We have all the dialogues now out. We want to focus for the next step on guiding whatever action we have to take and and uh, with the, the the engagement with the Africa with Africa uh, to orient the choses très très claires qu'on pourrait uh, to make sure that the direction is very clear. We already know some things. There are some themes that keep coming up. Energy is a big deal. Climate change and green energy is a big deal. Agriculture is a big deal. We cannot shy on the, those subjects. On voit déjà se dessiner quelques trames de notre. So we're seeing certain themes that are recurring. One of another thing. So uh, on a déjà des pistes qui nous. So we can already see these paths forward, and they'll become consolidated over time with the African Union. And you know, they don't want to hurry this. They want very clear strategies. Partnership there. They don't want to 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 d'avoir des partenaires qui vont quitter après deux ans. So they don't want partners to become involved who are going to take off after two or three years. They want a long-term relationship, and I'm sure that leadership will want to be involved for the next coming decades. The second one, and uh, I think we will be well uh, well positioned for 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 the next uh, decade uh, with our plan. Merci. Et um, maintenant, j'aimerais juste uh, lire. I would just like to read a notice of motion for the record. Uh, it was already sent to all members previously, um, my uh, notice of motion. Just reading it in for the record, for everyone's awareness. Um, que conformément à l'article. That pursuant to Standing Order 1082, the committee undertake. A, a strategic study for the Indo-Pacific region and Canada's responsibility to reinforce the uh, strengthen of the state-to-state uh, -state relationship and people-to-people -people relationship under the five priorities of the strategy. 30. B, expanding trade, investment, and supply chain resilience. C, investing in and connecting people. D, building a sustainable and green future. And E, fulfilling Canada's role as an active and engaged partner in the region. That the study include an examination of Canada's continued engagement with India and China, as well as A, efforts to strengthen ties between North, the North Pacific with Korea and Japan. B, opportunities created by increasing people-to-people -people ties between Canada and the Philippines as a result of the significant growth of the Filipino-Canadian community. C, the strategic partnership between Canada and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. D, the place of Pakistan situated at the nexus of the Indo-Pacific, Central Asia, and the Middle East, or, and other countries on the periphery of the Indo-Pacific region within the strategy. And E, the importance of strengthening relations with Pacific Islands nations as they face essential threats of climate change, that such a study consists of a minimum of six meetings, that the committee support its findings to the House, report its findings to the House, and that pursuant to Standing Order 109, the committee requests a government response. Thank you. Uh, we go to Mr. Abel Tafe. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for uh, the member. Uh, we don't have a copy of this motion. I'm not sure if it was distributed or not. It, it was sent to the clerk and I believe distributed to all members uh, several days ago. Several days ago. More than. Is that correct? Yes, uh, I was just advised by the uh, clerk that it was distributed on May 8th. Okay, uh, Mr. Bergeron. So I understand that Mr. Zubari simply uh, read the motion, doesn't necessarily want to discuss it today, so I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to come back to it. And maybe we could even do more than one, because I myself brought forward a motion on the relationship between India and Canada. So maybe that could be an opportunity to include that as well in that motion if uh, the committee agrees. And I think also that we're going to have to figure out how we're going to coordinate all this with the work uh, of the committee 
studying China-Canada relations uh, within the Indo-Pacific strategy. So we wouldn't want to basically uh, overlap with the work of other committees so that we can be efficient. But we'll have an opportunity to speak further on this, Chair. It will be on, uh, on Wednesday, actually. Uh, so next, uh, we go to Mr. Bergeron. You have uh, two minutes for your question. Merci, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to talk about the economy. How much time do I have, Chair? Two minutes. Canada has uh, signed 